All right. Well, good morning, Resurgence Church. It's good to see you uh, again this morning. So excited to be getting into the Word with you all. I hope you're able to join us uh, today. So um, the quick one quick announcement. I've, I've actually got an announcement. The ladies are going to be starting a Zoom uh, Bible study on Fridays, I believe it's 7.30, um, more of a, a devotional slash Bible study. So um, if you're interested in joining that, I'm sorry, just setting up my thing here. If you're interested in joining that, please, um, you can get in touch with the church um, or we will send out some information. If you are on our mind, you should be okay um, with that. Well, hold on just a moment. All right, so um, we're looking at John chapter 5 today. We're back in in, uh, our regularly scheduled John, John chapter 5, looking at verses 30 through 47 right now. Um, We we were off for a little bit because of uh, Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday. We stayed in John but moved ahead a little bit. So we're back where we left off. This is actually about five weeks ago. Actually, last time we were in John chapter 5, you know, in in our regular scheduled... um, reading of John was the last meeting that we were actually in the church building. So it's hard to believe it's been, uh, it's been five Sundays already since we've been able to see you all. And uh, do know that our hearts miss you. We are uh, anxiously awaiting the time that we'll all be able to be together again and see these chairs uh, filled up. Amen. So pray with us that the Lord would, uh, would have his way in the midst of all of this. Um, and also that we would be able to come together again. Right, we know that God uh, that uh, no virus can stop the church. Amen. So, let's get into the scripture for today. We're at John chapter five, verses thirty through forty-seven, and I'll begin by reading it. Jesus says, "I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true." You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you have believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? That's our reading from John chapter 5, verses 30 through 47, and let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a good king. I thank you that your word is clear and that you have given it to us, Lord, to feed us and to sustain us. I pray, Lord, that this word would go out. Lord, that there would be ears to hear, that you would prepare the soil of the hearts of the hearers and that your word would find uh, would find good soil, Lord, to, to rest in, and that there would be a, a fruit, a crop, a harvest that would be uh, taken from it, Lord. We love you and we praise you and ask you to be with us this day. Give me words to speak, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so... Um, Lengthy scripture today, I know. It's a little bit longer than what we usually do. Um, But it really needs to be taken as a whole chunk, I think, here in order to see 
what is happening. Uh, and, and what we see happening is, first thing here is that Jesus uses words like testimony and witness. And these conjure up uh, images of a, a court case or a trial. And in essence, that's really what is going on here. Uh, Jesus is, is mounting his defense against the unbelief of the Jewish leaders. All right, if you can remember back to when we started this study in October, uh, that was a, a while ago. We, we've been making our way slowly through this. If you can remember when uh, we started our study back in October, we, we talked about John setting up his gospel like uh, a defense of Jesus in the sense that he was calling witnesses. And so he makes his claims, we looked at the prologue, he makes his claims about who Jesus is in the prologue, and then he begins to call witnesses to prove the claims that he's made about Jesus in his prologue. And the first one up is John the Baptist, who says, he says, I'm not the Christ, I came only to prepare the way for the Christ. And then we have Jesus show up on the scene, and John the Baptist, now I'm paraphrasing, John the Baptist says, see, that's the guy I was talking about, that's the guy I came to announce. And then he says, Jesus, he says, there's the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. This is the testimony of John the Baptist. And it's pretty clear testimony, right? I mean, there's not a whole lot of ways to take that. Uh, And we'll get back to John the Baptist in just a little bit. But then John calls his next witness, and we meet Andrew, Andrew, who is one of the 12, okay? And Andrew testifies. He finds his brother Simon, and he testifies. He says, we have found the Messiah. So already acknowledging and making this claim, Jesus is the Messiah. After that, we have Philip. Jesus goes and gets Philip to follow him. First thing Philip does is he finds Nathanael, and he testifies. He gives his testimony. He says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, after that, I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff we could look at, but even Nicodemus, okay, comes and testifies. He's a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Jews. And he says this. He says that Jesus is clearly come from God because, he says, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, if we move into chapter 4, moving our way through the Gospel of John here, make our way to chapter 4, we get the testimony of the woman at the well who tells those living in Sychar in Samaria, she says, he told me all that I ever did, right? And then, and then she goes away and tells the people of the town. They come out to see Jesus because of her testimony, but then the people themselves believe and they proclaim, they give this testimony. They say, we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world, I mean, this is, this is profound testimony that all these people are, and John's just lining them up one after the other to give testimony to Jesus Christ. Even the woman at the well, if we backtrack just a little bit, when she's sitting there talking to Jesus before she tells the townspeople, she, she speaks of the Messiah. I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus says clearly to her, I who am speaking to you am he. And, you know, there's even more if we, if we read through, but it's, it's clear even from those examples that John has established, he's structured his gospel as one big argument, okay, making a claim. And the claim that he makes, he lays out all the way at the end there in chapter 20, the claim is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the claim. That's the, that's the whole point of this gospel. And John's calling witness after witness after witness. And why does he do that? Why does John take his time to write the gospel, to call forth the witnesses? He does it, he says there in John 20, so that his readers might believe and by believing have eternal life. Now, where did John get that idea from? Where did John, he gets that directly from Jesus who he followed and walked with on this earth for three and a half years during his ministry. And, you know, that's why you see how clear it is, how, how clearly John sets it up. And that's why it's, it's almost funny when in chapter 8, the text says that the people came to Jesus and they ask, who are you? As if, as if Jesus hadn't been saying it. Who are you? And Jesus answers them by saying, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. And he's not lying. He's, he's been saying it from the very first chapter of this gospel. And yet still, again, in chapter 10, John tells us that the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Of course, Jesus had been telling them plainly, but they refused to believe. We'll talk a little bit more about that 
in a little bit. But we see this theme of, of testimony, this idea of, of testimony and witnesses about Jesus going throughout all of John's gospel, really. Um, but I know it's been a while, like I said, since we've been back in chapter 5, so let me rebuild a little context, see where we are in the scripture right here as we get back into chapter 5. Um, if we look back earlier in the chapter, if you remember, now this is about a month ago, uh, Jesus had just healed a man who had been an invalid for 38 years. Remember that? Okay. Uh, and I had suggested that, that Jesus does this healing uh, intentionally, and he does it on a Sabbath intentionally so that he can create an occasion in order to confront the Jewish leaders about his identity and about who he is. All right, so, so that's the context of the portion of scripture that we're looking at today. Uh, if you remember, after that healing, he, he does start to have this conversation with the Jewish leaders, and Jesus claims to be doing the same work that the Father is doing. All right, he, he claims to have the same authority that the Father has, and he even claims to have life in himself as the Father has life in himself. In effect, claiming to be eternal, and uh, the, the, it wasn't lost on the Jewish leaders. They understood what he was saying because the, the text tells us there that from that moment on, they were looking for a way to kill him, okay? That's where we are right now in chapter five. That's the same, uh, same scene, same situation. This is just a little bit later in the conversation. So Jesus is still standing before those same people after having healed this guy at the pool um, and having this, this, now at this point, mounting a defense, basically, um, they're accusing Jesus of, of lying or of not being who he says he is because he just made all these, these claims about himself and they're like, I don't really believe that you're that. And so now what we've got is Jesus ready to start calling witnesses. Oh, you want me to prove it? I will prove it. Now, he's ready to start calling witnesses. Why does he have to call witnesses? He says in verse 31, if you have your Bibles, verse 31, I'll be taking you through the section that we just read. He says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, time out. First, Jesus is not suggesting he's a liar. He's not suggesting that he's not telling the truth, okay? It really should be understood as him saying, if I alone bear witness about myself, then it wouldn't be adequate testimony. It wouldn't be sufficient testimony or acceptable in a court of law. That's really what he means because the truth is that even if Jesus bore witness about himself and he was the only one bearing witness about himself, then his testimony would still be absolutely true. Uh, he's not saying that he would be lying. The point he's making has to do with uh, Jewish law concerning the, witness of test, uh, the testimony of witnesses. So if we uh, go back to that Old Testament law, we're looking at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 17.6 and Deuteronomy 19.15. Let's take a look at those two real quick. Deuteronomy 17.6. Uh, it says this, on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, uh, sorry, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Now, next time it comes up is Deuteronomy 19.15, which says this, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Now, of course, both of those verses deal with uh, the burden of proof on the prosecution, but the same standards would apply to any, any claim that's being made. And in this case, Jesus is making a claim of being sent from the Father. Uh, in other words, he's claiming to be Messiah. Now, I mentioned in the past that, you know, it's an interesting study to go through the Gospel of John, just looking at the verses where Jesus talks about being sent from the Father. And here, even here, we have four times that he makes reference to being sent from the Father. And so we've already seen that Jesus, Jesus is really making no secret about, about who he is, about where he came from. And we've already seen that the people, particularly the religious leaders, refuse to believe. But Jesus, in his patience, demonstrates um, his mercy, right? In his, in his, in his uh, patience in, in sharing with them, he demonstrates this, uh, this grace and this mercy, that uh, abundant mercy of God, I'm sorry. See, the law, as we just read, requires a minimum of two witnesses, 
right? Or three witnesses if you really want to make sure. The, the phrasing is always two witnesses or three witnesses. So two is minimum. Three is if you really want to be sure. So what does Jesus do here? He actually gives us four witnesses, okay? Uh, he says basically, look, I don't need any word other than my own to prove uh, the truth of what I say, but in deference to your law, I'll provide witnesses. And he actually gives us four witnesses. And before we list those four witnesses, I just want to point out again his motivation for doing this. In verse 34, he gives us the reason for his patience in confirming who he is after he's been asked and asked and he said it and he said it and he said it. He says this, I say these things so that you may be saved. And this, this is just, that's one of those verses that just arrest me, stop me, because it's such an amazing demonstration of God's patience and mercy because Jesus, Jesus is not only taking more than abundant care to make sure that there is evidence, that there is proof, that there, everybody's had an opportunity here, but he's saying this to people that he knows will refuse him. I, I, I even think of when he washed the disciples' feet, he washes the feet of Judas knowing what Judas is about to do. And yet he has mercy. He even tells them in verse 40, if you look ahead a little bit, he says, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And so Jesus is being merciful here, but listen, he's also claiming again to be the giver of life. If he came to me, I would give you life, he says. It's so simple, yet so many refuse it. And and in an abundance of mercy, Jesus calls witnesses. Now, I keep saying it's mercy, and it is mercy, but listen, it's also judgment, all right? Because the more evidence there is, the more witnesses who testify, the greater the condemnation for refusing to believe. Because, listen, the clearer it becomes that Jesus is the Messiah sent from God, that he is the way of salvation, the clearer that becomes, the clearer it becomes that people's refusal to believe is not due to ignorance, so that none can claim that, that they didn't know, all right? But when judgment comes, they will receive only what they chose. And they will not be able to charge God with being unjust. And, and that is terrifying to me for so many people. But if you will receive it, it is mercy. So if you take notes, I said there are four witnesses. Here are the four witnesses that Jesus calls. First up is John the Baptist, We'll talk about him again real quick. Second is the works themselves, the works that he's doing. Third is the Father himself. And fourth is the scriptures. So we've got John the Baptist, the works, the Father, and the scriptures. And we'll go through those four, okay? So first, starting at verse 33, Jesus says, You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So there's Jesus' first witness. He says, John the Baptist. And I've already mentioned some of the ways that he testified to Jesus, some of the things that he said. But this was a, a very, we have to recognize, this was a very significant and very vocal witness to Jesus Christ. The ministry of John the Baptist, it, it created a stir in Israel, right? I mean, they might not have had the social media that we have, but word got out pretty quickly that there was this guy baptizing people in the wilderness who was preparing the way for the Messiah. Now, we don't get a whole lot of what John said. He was ministering for a while. We don't have a whole lot of, uh, uh, of what he actually said, but of what he does say, he doesn't mince words, right? The bit that we do get from him, his witness is pretty clear and unambiguous. He says, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He claims that uh, prophetic word. And he says, among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. And look, that's pretty clear. He's saying what he's doing. He's ushering. We're waiting for one that's going to come after him. He's not worthy to untie a sandal. This is going to be the guy. If that's not clear enough, he says, I have seen and borne witness that this, he's talking to Jesus, about Jesus, is the Son of God. And the people were anxiously awaiting a Messiah. So, so that got people pretty excited, right? And, and we can't overlook the fact that the text says that the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, okay? Um, Because 
they, they wanted to find out what he was all about. I mean, those were some of the highest authorities uh, in, 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 their, in the religion of the day, and they were going to personally interview G, uh, John the Baptist because word had made it back to Jerusalem that something was up. And their first question is, who are you? Okay, always that first question, who are you? All right, and his, his answer actually gives us some insight into what they really mean when they say, who are you? They say, he, because he says, I am not the Christ, right? Like that only makes sense if the assumption is when they are asking, who are you? Um, I am not the Christ. Their next question then, they say, what then are you Elijah? Now, why do they go to Elijah? Because the expectation, again, you have to keep in mind, the expectation is for Messiah, coming of Messiah. John just said he's preparing the way for Messiah. Well, then they say, well, then are you Elijah? Because they go to Malachi 4, 5, which says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now, John says he's not Elijah, and that's true. He's not physically Elijah, uh, but Luke 1, 17 tells us that John comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, and in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus tells the crowds that John the Baptist is the Elijah who is to come. So, John's witness was pretty direct. Jesus even points this out to the people that he's talking to now in chapter 5, right? He reminds them that they sent to John, right? They heard from John's own mouth his testimony. And he's kind of not throwing that back in their face, but he's reminding them that you heard John's testimony. You, you, uh, he was a burning and shining lamp, he says. And you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. In other words, he's saying their lack of belief isn't, for a lack of witness. There came a point in time when they decided not to believe. Because John's testimony was bold, right? It was, it was clear and it had some pretty direct and awesome uh, implications. And so it was, a, it was a pretty good testimony. I think it's a pretty good first witness for Jesus to call. Like, hey, you heard it from John's own mouth. That's a pretty good witness, right? But then look what he says in verse 36. He says, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. So if John's testimony was great, he goes, I've got even better for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I'm doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So if John the Baptist was, was tough to ignore, I mean, these signs, they're even harder to explain away. I and mean, now we already looked at Nicodemus' words in John 3. You know, even a top Pharisee, uh, a ruler of the people, had to admit that no one could do the signs that Jesus was doing unless God was with him. So the works themselves testify to Jesus' connection with God. In John 10, verses 37 and 38, Jesus says, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Now, notice, notice what the works testify to. All right, as Nicodemus said, as Jesus said in what we just read, they testify to the relationship between Jesus and the Father. All right? not, they're not testifying to Jesus' own power and his own authority, but they align him with the Father. Listen, that means he is aligned with the Father's ministry, his unfolding of history, his plans, his purposes. He is part of the very will and intention of God himself. Right? He, he's not just some rogue Messiah out there. He is aligned with the Father. Later in chapter 9 of this gospel, Jesus heals a man born blind. And the Pharisees call this guy to themselves. They, they get like, we've got to figure this out, this, this, this miracle that we can't dispute. And so they call the man to them and interview him to find out how it happened. And, and the man tells them. They send him away. They don't believe it, right? Even after the man tells them, they refuse to believe that Jesus uh, could be from God because the healing took place on the Sabbath. And that's such a block for them. But listen to what the man says uh, back to them and how it gets to the purpose of these signs. John nine thirty. the man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So even though Jesus often rebukes the crowds for seeking after signs, there is a purpose for the signs. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doing them, right? And the purpose is to testify 
to his union with the Father. So there's our first two witnesses, Jesus calls John the Baptist and the works themselves, okay? Next, Jesus goes on in verse 37, and he claims the Father as a witness. He says, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Now, that's interesting. He says you do not have his word abiding in you, and his evidence of that is that they don't believe the one whom he sent. So if the word of God is abiding in you, one of the natural results is that it's going to uh, uh, lead you to, if not allow you to, believe the one that he sent that would be the fruit of it but since they don't believe christ he can tell he says i know you do not have the word of god abiding in you it hasn't made a home in you otherwise you'd believe me now first the most obvious event that jesus is pointing to with the father as a witness is his baptism Uh, matthew records it this way in his gospel matthew 1 starting at verse 16 says and when jesus was baptized immediately he went up from the water And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. But Jesus says they refused to believe the witness because they refused to believe the one he sent. And this idea that that Jesus is sent from the Father, we've talked about a couple times, it comes up again and again. So I just want to look briefly at that because in verse 43 he says it directly he says i have come in my father's name and that's an interesting phrase i I just want to explore a little bit because it's actually the only place in the bible where it's uttered uh nobody else in the entire bible says that they come in the father's name there's some things close we'll talk about but throughout the old testament priests are said to minister in the name of the lord not in the name of the father they they are said to bless in the name of the Lord. Prophets are said to speak in the name of the Lord and prophesy in the name of the Lord. Various people do this or do that in the name of the Lord. They call on the name of the Lord. But that verb to come is is part of the distinction here. In fact, there's only twice in the Old Testament, only twice that that verb come is connected with the Lord, uh, with the name of the Lord. And the first one is when David comes against Goliath. You might, you might already know the verse. He says, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, okay? And the other one, the only other place in the Old Testament where we see that is actually Psalm 118, which says, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And if you remember just two weeks ago, we celebrated Palm Sunday and we see that that scripture is applied to Jesus as he comes in on the triumphal entry. And so that's interesting in itself, I think. I I read those kinds of things, and I say, well, that's interesting, you know, how rarely anyone claims to come in the name of the Lord, but that's not even what Jesus says here. He says, I have come in my Father's name. And so we have him calling God Father, right, rather than Lord, which already suggests some intimacy and closeness of relationship. But notice that God's not just the Father. He's not just some universal Father, but Jesus calls him my Father. And I would suggest that the Jews noticed, all right? Uh, just to build out some context here to see how unique this was. Some years ago, there was a, there's a German theologian named, uh, I'm not sure how to say his name, actually, Joachim Jeremias, I think, something like that. And he was doing research in New Testament literature. And, and, and he found that in the entire history of Judaism, uh, we're talking Old Testament and even extra-biblical texts, Jewish writings dating from the beginning of Judaism through the 10th century AD. So we're talking about a 3,000-year period that he studied. There is not a single reference in Jewish writing of a Jewish person addressing God directly in the first person as Father. Now, they may have spoken, you will see them speak of the fatherhood of God. But nowhere in all of that, never did anyone address God as their father directly. And so you have Jesus stand up and say, my father, that's the kind of thing that'll get your attention if you're a person studied in uh, the scripture, studied in Jewish history as these men were. And to come next in the name, all right, not just that he's saying my father, but then he says he comes in the name of the father, all that's associated with that, it, it implies that they carry or walk in the authority of that person named, right? The name represents the full rank, the full authority of a 
person, their interests, the deeds that they've done, all of that is wrapped up in their name. So when Jesus claims that he has come in the name of his Father, he's not only claiming an intimate relationship with God that they found blasphemous, but he's also claiming the authority and the power of God, which they also found blasphemous. And three times in Scripture, we see God speak directly from heaven as a witness to his Son. All right, and Jesus says that he calls on the Father as a witness. First, as we said, it was at his baptism. The second time is at the transfiguration. Jesus is up on the mountain, uh, and, and he, he basically repeats what he says at the baptism. And then there's a third time uh, in John 12, 28, after Jesus has prayed in a crowd. He prays that God would glorify his name, and it says that then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now, interestingly, not everyone was able to distinguish the words there. They, they heard it. It says that some said that it had thundered. So um, that may be why Jesus can say, you know, his voice you have never heard, he says to the people. Um, I don't know if it's that he, they didn't hear his voice literally or if he's saying like he was saying, but his word does not abide in your heart. It might just be that, you know, whoever has ears to hear, maybe they heard it but didn't hear it, you know. Um, but Jesus himself says that the Father testifies to him. And that is an even greater witness than, than John or even the works. And the last witness, and we'll wrap it up here, the last witness that Jesus calls that we're going to look at, it's just the entirety of the Old Testament. Just the whole Old Testament. All Scripture, he says, right? I mean, that's, a, that's like pulling out like the trump card. He's like, yeah, all of Scripture testifies to me. He says this in verse 39. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. And look, it's a bigger task than I can, um, I can manage in, in the little bit of time that we have today to show all the ways that the scriptures witness about Jesus. But we, we have spent some time in other messages uh, drawing some of these out, whether it's through specific prophecies fulfilled by Jesus or shadows of Christ in the Old Testament, in the old stories, or in the old characters. Okay, um, I want to focus today instead on the specific charge that Jesus makes against the religious leaders here. See, I, I've been talking about Jesus calling these witnesses um, as, as if he's mounting a defense, and, and, I, and that's true, but here he, he kind of turns the tables. He, he actually levels a pretty serious charge against his accusers or the skeptics that are there. All right, now first, understand that these were men that prided themselves on their adherence to the Mosaic law. They study the scriptures. They know the laws, but these are the same people that Jesus accuses of straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. And we're going to hear a lot of that idea here. You know, in a sense, they, the expression, they miss the forest for the trees. You know, they're, they're so busy looking at the minutia, the, the details of the law, and, and making up <laughs> parts of the law, you know, adding stuff to it, that they miss the fulfillment of the law when he's standing in their midst. And Jesus, Jesus points this irony out to them, okay? Uh, to the ones who spend so much time studying the scriptures, uh, the ones who place all their hope in the word of God, yet they fail to believe the fulfillment of that word. And at the root of it, Jesus says in verse 44, it, it, it's that in their hearts, they are seeking their own glory. And they're receiving glory from one another rather than seeking the glory that comes from God. And friends, Listen, this is not just an accusation that is fixed in the history books, all right? This is an accusation that is still, I believe, leveled at those who study the scriptures or claim that they are Christians. This idea, Jesus says, you study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness to me. Uh, yeah, it's, you look, it's the liberal theologians, you know, those, those guys studying in, in the colleges and universities and, and you got these guys that study the, the word of God and, and yet they'll deny the virgin birth. They'll deny the resurrection, all right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's those liberal theologians. But listen, it's also the everyday Christian. It's also the, the everyday Christian who, by that very title, claims the name of Christ but denies him 
in their actions. Paul says in Titus 1 that there are those who profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. He says that they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. And Jesus says in John 14 that the proof of our love for him is going to be our obedience to his word. And even in the church, listen, even in the church among the faithful who genuinely do seek God and strive to be obedient to his word, we can confess that, yeah, Jesus' words have at times been aimed at us as well. Our brother uh, Mark Berkowitz three weeks ago preached a word about being freed from greatness to do great things. And he was talking about the temptation as believers to fall into the pride of ministry or, or the temptation of ministering to God for the praises of men. And listen, it's easy to fall into that because it feels good to have the approval of, of people we are surrounded by, people we're close to, people we care about. And if we're honest, we may never, okay, if you could really search the depths of your heart, we may never minister in a purely selfless way, and I thank God that his grace covers us. But this accusation that Jesus brings against those who are listening, it should warn us that in our service to God, in our Christian walks, we must constantly reevaluate our motives and seek only the glory of God. And when we do those, those self-checkups, when we reevaluate, and we do those self-checkups, and we realize that hmm, maybe I am a little too concerned with what man or, or woman would say about me, the approval of man, then what do we do? We repent. We repent, and we pray that the Lord would refocus our hearts. And, and I'm not just talking about official ministry, right? You don't need a title and a position in a church to be doing ministry. Anything that you do in the name of the Lord is ministry. Any kindness that you show your neighbor or your family, if done in the name of the Lord, it's ministry. But we need to be continually, listen, we need to be continually drawn back to Jesus as the source and the fulfillment of every promise of God. See, th- the sin of the Jewish leaders here isn't in thinking that there is life in the scriptures. Jesus doesn't deny that. The sin is in missing Jesus as the source of that life that the scriptures point to. They claim to believe Moses. They claim to follow his law, but in verse 46, Jesus says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. And in saying that, Jesus claims the witness of the Old Testament. Like I said, we don't have time to get into all of it, but he's claiming the witness of the Old Testament by claiming to be the fulfillment of the promises and the prophecies it contains. Moses wrote of me. And church, our strength and our hope, okay, is in recognizing that all of these witnesses confirm exactly what Jesus says about himself. Not that he needs witnesses, this is the greatest part. Not that he could just say it and we would have to take it, take him at his word or don't, right? But he does this. He gives us all this extra evidence, all these extra witnesses so that we may be saved. And I praise God for his mercy and his grace that was so thorough in establishing the witness of Jesus Christ so that we would have every opportunity to come to a saving faith in the one sent by God to be our salvation. And I thank God that so many of those listening uh, today have trusted in Jesus for the salvation. And if you have, you may wonder, well, why do I need to hear it again? Well, listen, to the believer who is listening, I say, rejoice. Rejoice today in the source of your deliverance. Are you stuck at home? Yeah. Are you getting bored? Maybe. You forget what day of the week it is? Yes. But rejoice, saints, all right, in the source of your deliverance. Draw strength from his mercy. Glorify God for the provision that he gave in seeking and saving what was lost. And then be empowered to go and share that gospel with others. And to those who who may be listening, all right, and you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, maybe you just stumbled upon this, maybe maybe you recognize my face and you're hanging out for a little bit. Listen, to those who have not put their faith in Jesus, or, or maybe you're trusting in your own goodness. You could say, well, how, how do you know you get into heaven? Well, I've done some good things. I'm not a bad person. All right, I hear that a lot, okay? And I say, well, what does that mean? At the end of, the, at the end of days, you, you're gonna take all your good deeds and all your bad deeds, and you're gonna put them on a scale, and, and you're just gonna hope that you've done one more good deed than bad, and, and the scale's gonna tip in your favor. And they'll, they'll say, yeah, 
That's, that's their thinking. That's, that's what's getting me to heaven. Listen, if you're trusting in your own goodness and your own righteousness to save you, listen to what Jesus says in verse 45. He says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. See, if you don't know a lot of the background, he's talking about the law there, the Mosaic law. He's talking about this method, okay, by which you could earn salvation by your adherence to the law. If you could just keep those Ten Commandments perfectly, if you could just keep all those commands perfectly, then you would get to heaven. And that's true, okay? The only problem is nobody keeps those commandments perfectly. The law is good, it is beautiful, but it is not attainable because of man's fallen nature. So if you are banking on your own righteousness to get you into heaven, Jesus says, listen, Jesus says, he won't get in your way. Okay, he will let you serve as attorney in your own defense. But it will be the worst thing you can do because the very law that you are counting on to exonerate you will ultimately expose the true depth of your sin and the hypocrisy of your heart. Far better to let the blood of Jesus plead on your behalf by yielding to him and placing your trust in him alone. And I pray that you would this morning. Even now, if you never have, I pray that you would yield your heart, submit, and receive the forgiveness that God has for your life. And if that's you, then listen, I know we, we're not here. I can't call you up and, and pray with you. But listen, we have a website. You could click the link at the top of this or on our page. And we have... Um, It's a newly designed website. It's got uh, a spot where you can fill out information and ask for prayer. I'd love for you to fill that out and and we'll get an email. The the elders, myself, we can give you a call. We would love to pray with you. We would love to answer any questions you have. You say, all right, it sounds almost too good to be true. Maybe you have some questions. Email us, okay? I would love to be able to talk with you. love to be able to pray with you. Um, And I pray that you would do that now. But church, listen, let's continue to rejoice in the sovereign power of our God, in the mercy that he showed us in the person of Jesus Christ, in the standard that he has called us to in serving him, and in the hope that he has promised for those who endure. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you are merciful toward us, Lord, and that you gave abundant witness so that we may be saved. I thank you, Lord, that you cared enough that it wasn't just take my word or or walk, but Lord, you have given us every reason and every opportunity to believe. And so we praise you today. We thank you for your goodness. I pray that this word would, uh, would have struck home for any who hear, Lord, that it would encourage those who believe, that it would convict those who don't. And we ask you to just draw us ever nearer to you, Lord, that we would walk nearer to you every day, every moment. We praise you and we thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Church, I thank you for um, joining us today and I look forward to seeing you uh, maybe midweek. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday, if not. All right, God bless you.